Hi, I'm Ben with uh, Grace Community Church. I'm one of the pastors here, and I wanted to thank you for watching this sermon. I pray that it serves you well, that it will help you grow in your understanding of God's Word, the Bible, that it will deepen your love for Christ and help you to pursue holiness in your own life. And we are glad that you're here watching this video, but uh, we, we also pray that this video would not be a, a replacement for your own local church and sitting under the preaching and teaching of your own pastor. Um, but we do pray that it, it helps you, that it edifies you. If you have any questions about this sermon or our church in general, feel free to visit our website, gracecommunitychurchberea.com and hit the contact us button. We'll be happy to help you in any way that we can. And may God be glorified through your listening to this sermon. One of the endearing and enduring memories of my childhood is the tantalizing smell of fresh baked bread that frequently wafted out of her oven to my delight. And the smell of baking bread, even to this day, transports me right back to my childhood and to grandma's kitchen. And if your parents or perhaps your grandparents baked bread, you probably can remember that wonderful smell. I mean, to have a piece of hot sliced bread just slathered in butter, hmm, nothing much better than that, is there? You know, and I'm not alone in loving bread. That's why a lot of uh, sit-down restaurants that you go to, they will bring you a, a basket of bread or rolls or something like that. And then, of course, if you can afford to go to Red Lobster every uh, on your birthday, normally when I get to go, uh, you get those cheddar biscuits and they just, just slap your brains out. Them things are so good, you know. There's just something very appealing and appetizing about bread. And John chapter 6 is all about bread. The chapter opens with the account of Jesus feeding some 5,000 hungry people. And what did he feed them with? He fed them with bread. And where did this bread come from? Well, there was a little boy numbered amongst the crowd that day who his mama had packed him a little lunch. He had five little loaves and two little pieces of fish. Well, he gave that to Jesus. And from that meager beginning, Jesus performed a miracle. And he blessed the bread and he blessed the fish. And he was able to feed this vast multitude of people with the bread that he provided. Now, it's interesting that the scene shifts quite dramatically and quite suddenly in John chapter 6 because John then records that the disciples of Jesus, they, they got into a boat and they were going to uh, set sail, if you will, but they had to pull on the oars to get across the Sea of Galilee to the other side of the sea. And John also makes clear to us that Jesus did not get in the boat with them. Jesus stayed in the boat, stayed behind on the shore. Well, as they began, as the disciples began to make their way across the sea, a couple of things happened. Number one, it got dark. And number two, it began to storm. And it wasn't any ordinary storm. And no matter how hard they pulled against the oars, they were absolutely making no progress. And then in the midst of the storm, they see a figure of a man walking on the water. Now picture this. Try and put yourself in the boat. It's dark. It's damp. The wind is howling. The wind is at such a gale force that the white caps are pure foam. And... Here's this figure on the water, and it doesn't seem like any of that is bothering him at all. He just keeps walking steadily on. Needless to say, the men in the boat, even though they were experienced fishermen, many of them were experienced fishermen, and they certainly had experienced turbulence on the water before, but the text very, uh, I think, unsurprisingly says, when all this combined and they saw this figure on the water, they were very frightened. But the disciples soon realized that it was actually Jesus who was walking on the water and he was headed their way. 
Jesus draws near and he tells them to not be afraid. And John records that as soon as Jesus got into the boat, they immediately were on the shore that they had been struggling so mightily to try and reach. You know, just think, I think we kind of gloss over that sometimes when we read that. And the best way for me to, well, perhaps not the best way to illustrate, but one way I can illustrate it is if you're a Star Trek fan, a Star Trek fan? All right, Jeremiah, I knew, I knew why we let you into the church. Now, if you, if you remember some of the Star Treks, particularly one that I remember was Captain Picard, and he would say, engage, right? Engage. As soon as they would engage, boom, they would achieve what they call warp speed, and they'd be gone. It's kind of like what happened here with Jesus. Here they are, they're floundering in the middle of the sea, the wind and the waves are all around, and Jesus gets into the boat and boom, engage. And there they are on the other shore. Well, then John goes on to say that the hungry crowd that Jesus had fed the day before, the 5,000, there were a certain segment of them who searched for Jesus the next day. Say, well, why were they looking for Jesus? Well, guess what they wanted? They wanted more bread. They, they wanted another free meal. Now, listen carefully. They didn't want Jesus. They only wanted what Jesus could provide. They didn't want him so much as to what he could give. They wanted Jesus to perform a miracle for them or to give them something that they wanted, but that was all that they wanted from him. All this crowd wanted was more bread. Their sin had blinded their eyes to the reality of who he truly was. So this whole chapter revolves around bread. And Jesus seizes upon their desire for physical bread to teach them a profound spiritual truth. Jesus uses the metaphor of bread to try and teach them important truth concerning his true identity and what he had to offer them. Truth, if they could understand it, and if they would act upon it, it would literally change them from the inside out and provide them what they truly needed and what they were truly looking for, though they didn't immediately recognize it. So he uses the metaphor of bread to show them that their greatest need was not physical, but was spiritual. Likewise. Your greatest need, my greatest need, is not physical, it is spiritual. And that was the lesson that Jesus was trying to teach them on that day, and that is the lesson that he's trying to teach you and I on this day. Now, what we actually have here in the entirety of John, or this portion that Ben read for us, is really a sermon that Jesus preached. And so, by the way of a recorded and written text, we have the privilege of listening to this sermon of Jesus. So, what I would like to do is, is put Jesus' sermon into four points and show you what Jesus was preaching in his sermon. So, here we go. First point is, very simply, what Jesus says about himself. Notice in verse 35 how Jesus describes himself. Jesus said to them, verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So again, Jesus uses this metaphor throughout this encounter with the crowd to help both them, and I'll say it again, help us to understand that he is so much more than they believed him to be. A lot of people believe about Jesus, but they don't believe on Jesus. And there's a world of difference. Jesus was trying to get them to believe on him, not just about him. They, meaning the crowd, believed that he was just another man like Moses. They believed that he was just another prophet like Moses. And after all, Moses, they mistakenly claimed or believed, fed the nation of Israel with manna during their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And so when they saw Jesus feeding the 5,000, they thought, well, hey, here's another man like Moses who can also feed us. So the crowd said to Jesus in verse 31, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, 
As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, again, the he there is, the, the crowd is referring to Moses. Well, Jesus immediately corrects their mistaken belief by saying that it wasn't Moses who actually gave them the bread, but the source of the bread was from heaven, meaning that it was from the Father. Okay. Moses was the intermediary, if you will, but Moses didn't provide the bread. God the Father provided the bread. Verse 32, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. And then, listen carefully what Jesus says, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Moses didn't give the original bread. God the Father did. And now the bread that God the Father has given you is the true spiritual bread. It's something much better than manna. This is what he's trying to get them to see. They could understand what bread was. They could understand how they needed bread. But he wanted them to understand, yes, just as much as you need that physical bread, you need the spiritual bread so much more. So they understood that the manna came from heaven, but again, they were mistaken who actually gave them the bread. Now, why does Jesus refer to himself as bread? Now, listen, please. Please, 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 listen carefully. Why does Jesus refer to himself as bread? Here's why. He is using the metaphor of bread to communicate to them that he is intended to be to their souls and our souls what bread is to the body. What is bread to the body? Absolutely essential. And even today, we refer to bread as a staple of life. Bread's a necessary food. When you can't afford any other kind of food, you can probably afford bread. Bread is enough to sustain you and to keep you alive. Even a prisoner got what? Bread and water. Bread is a food that suits all from the richest to the poorest. And as the true bread from heaven, Jesus was trying to get them to see that, hey, I and only I can satisfy the longing that exists within every human heart. Bread satisfies when you're hungry. Just give me some bread. Right? I like to have, you know, I, I can't do this a whole lot because of my medical condition, but I like to have bread for uh, toast for breakfast. And Sherry was like, don't you want something with that? Yeah, butter. Amen. You know, Bread satisfies. And Jesus was trying to get them to see that, hey, just as you, you're craving physically this bread, spiritually, whether you realize it or not, you're craving the bread of life. And I'm the bread of life. And the Father has sent me to you. J.C. Ryle says, whatever our spiritual necessity may be, however starving, famished, weak, and desperate our condition, there is enough in Christ in despair. He is bread. So what does Jesus say about himself? What's the first point of his sermon? That he is the bread of life. And that only he can satisfy what our hearts are craving. But that's not all that Jesus has to say. He also has something to say, and this is point two, of those who come to him. Look at verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Now, a, a key word, an important word in verse 37 is the word come. You may want to highlight that, circle that, make some kind of note of that. Now, the, the word come signifies movement. But it's not physical movement. Jesus is not referring to movement in space, such as I would say to Javier, come here. He's not referring to that kind of physical movement. It's not the kind of uh, thing like when you say to your kids, hey, come over here. It's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is referring to the movement of a person's soul. 
And this movement takes place. This movement happens when you fix your eyes on Christ. And with the help of the, whole, of the Father and the help of the Holy Spirit, you begin to recognize the beauty and the value of Christ. While simultaneously you begin to see the truth about yourself. When you come to Christ, you begin to recognize that he is holy, pure, and righteous. And you're not. That you're none of those things. You have a, an experience like Isaiah who... When he saw God, what did he say? Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of unclean people. He recognized his own sinfulness when he saw the holiness of God. The movement of the soul takes place when you recognize that Jesus is the object of your hunger and thirst, though you may not have realized up until this point in your life. And people try a multitude of things to find satisfaction. It could be in their education. It could be in their careers. It could be in some relationship, some achievement. And they try one thing after another, and nothing satisfies, and nothing satisfies, and nothing satisfies. But yet, we continue that quest, don't we? We are continually driven forward. We are propelled forward. We, it's almost an unstoppable force. We've got to find something that satisfies us. Many times people never find it because they're looking in the wrong place. They think that somehow a physical achievement can satisfy a spiritual need, and it can't, and it won't, and it never will. When you recognize Jesus for the treasure that he is, there is no sacrifice too great to make for him. So where does repentance come in in this whole deal? Here's where it comes in at. When you see Christ, you're more than happy to repent. God gives you that gift. You're glad to do it. You would gladly and willingly give up all that you thought would satisfy you for what will and does satisfy you. Now notice that two times in verse 37, Jesus uses the word me. In fact, Jesus repeatedly uses the word me throughout John chapter 6. I think he does it some seven times. So what is the point that Jesus is making? Here it is. The point is, Jesus trying to communicate to both them and us that he and he alone is the source of salvation. And in our salvation, our deepest longings of, of our soul is met and satisfied. The point is that Jesus is trying to show us that he and he alone can satisfy the deepest longings and the deepest hunger of the human soul. So a person is saved when their sins are forgiven, when they come to Christ. When they come to Jesus, recognizing the reality of who he is and who they are. Now listen carefully. No one has ever been saved by a set of doctrines or a set of beliefs. Can I say that again? You can be reformed to the core in your beliefs and still die and go to hell. Why? Because you're putting your faith, your trust, your confidence in a set of doctrines. Calvin is not your Savior. Jesus is the only Savior. Okay. Be careful. Examine yourself. Are you just believing in a set of doctrines? Or are you believing in the person of Christ? Faith in Christ saves Faith and doctrine or a set of beliefs apart from Christ damns. Jesus says to all who come to him, he will not cast them out. I say, what does that mean? Here's what it means. Jesus says that he will not, no, never, at any time, under any circumstances, reject the one who comes to him. Oh, you Calvinists, you just think only certain people can be saved. Listen, who can be saved? Anybody who wants to be, amen? Anybody who wants to be? Anybody that will come, they can be saved. 
No matter what your past, your present may be like, if you come to him, he will save you. And in your salvation, you are eternally secure. Point number three, point one, what he says about himself. Point two, what he says about those who come to him. Point three, what Jesus says about the Father. Now, let's look at verses 38 through 40. Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now you notice that in each one of these verses, Jesus refers to the will of the Father. Jesus makes it crystal clear that he has not come to do his own will. He's not down here freelancing. He was sent by the Father to do the Father's will. He has come to do the will of the Father. So, what is behind everything that Jesus is saying and doing? Now, this is important. What is behind it all? The will of God. The will of the Father. Can God's will ever be stopped? No. No. So Jesus is saying to that crowd then and to this crowd today, I have been sent by my Father to do his will, and you know what? It will be done. Now, there's multiple parts of the will of the Father here. First, Jesus says, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. So Jesus makes it clear that all who come to him do so because it is the will of the Father that they come to him. And all who come to Christ do so because they are a gift of love from the Father to the Son. The Bible is clear about that. God has promised, made a commitment, if you will, to give a certain group of people to his son as a gift of love. And the love of the father for his son is so great that not nary a one of his gift to his son can ever be wasted or lost. Not one. Second, in giving all those who come to Christ The Father gives the assignment to the Son that he will keep them eternally secure. So let me say it a better way, which you're probably glad of. God gives this love gift to his Son. That's part of his will. Here's another part of his will. Son, you can't lose any of that I give you. The Father gives, that's his will. It's also his will that Jesus never loses a single one. Jesus has the responsibility to keep his children secure. Why? Because it's the will of the Father. Okay. Do you see how this is all wrapped up in the will of the Father? Third, not only will Jesus keep eternally secure all that the Father gives to him, He will also raise them up on the last day. See, again, why will this take place? Because it's the will of the Father. And Jesus always does what? He always obeys the Father's will. You never have to doubt that you're that if you are in Christ, that you are going to be raised to eternal life. Why? It's the Father's will. And the Son always does the Father's will. Okay. So, of course, this Jesus is speaking here of, of our resurrection. Just as he would be raised from the dead, so too will all those who die in Christ undergo their own resurrection, to never die again. Both the body and the soul of the Christian is eternally secure. Listen, I I don't mean this in an irreverent or uh, any kind of way like that. If If you are involved in some kind of accident, and let's say that your body is just completely blown to smithereens, does this, does this not hold true for you? No. Your body will be raised, but it'll be better, amen? It'll be a glorified body. Everything that has been entrusted to the Son 
is safe and secure forever and ever. So Jesus says this twice. He says, this is the will of my Father that all he gives to me will come to me, and all who come to me will believe in me, and I will raise them up on the last day. And as we learn in our study of Revelation, the Christian dies how many times? Just once. Just once. And then they're raised to eternal life to live in joy and peace in the presence of God. All right, point one, what what Jesus says about himself. Point two, what he says about those who come to him. Point three, what Jesus says about the Father. Point four, what Jesus says to you. What Jesus says to you. Look at verse 40. This is where we've been headed. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Do you wonder how you become a Christian? By the way, that's the most important question you can ever consider because it deals not only with your life now, but your life in eternity. How does one become a Christian? How do you gain access to eternal life? Well, that's exactly what Jesus has been trying to show them as well as you and I through his teaching. A person becomes a Christian when they come to Christ, when they look to Christ, when they believe in Christ. Now notice, these are not statements that have different meanings. These are parallel statements. They are synonymous statements. They all lead to the same outcome. Salvation. Coming. Believing. Looking. They all refer to salvation. Remember what Jesus said in verse 35? I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Again, he's using this metaphor here to paint them the picture of salvation. Salvation is a satisfaction. Salvation is achieving the satisfaction that we were created to experience. But that was ripped from us. And now because we live in a world of sin, We can't find satisfaction apart from Christ. So salvation happens when you come to Christ. And why do you want to come to Christ? Because the Father has given you to Christ. Jesus said again in verse 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me. Therefore, when you come to Christ, you will believe in Christ, because the Father has given you to Christ. And Christ will never cast out. Christ will never turn anyone away that the Father has given to him. And you come to Christ when your soul, because your soul has been awakened to see the beauty and the glory of Christ. You come to Christ because of this hunger and this longing in your soul that you've tried to satisfy with all other kinds of stuff and none of it has worked. And then... You see Christ, and you see him as the bread of life. You come to him, you look to him, and you believe in him, and you finally realize that you have finally found what you have been looking for, your eternal life. Jesus, as the bread of life, satisfies the deepest longing of our souls. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, and I hope that you are thinking this question, how do I know if the Father has given me to Christ? How do I know if the Father has given me to Christ? Well, the good news is, it's a very simple answer. Come to Christ. Say, what? What? Come to Christ. Act upon what God is doing in your life. And if you will come to Christ, he will not cast you out. What does that mean? He will not turn you away. And by coming to Christ, guess what you will know? That the Father has given you to the Son. And in knowing that, you will have eternal life 
and Jesus will raise you up on the last day. J.C. Ryle summarizes for us, he says, Coming is the soul's movement towards Christ. Believing is the soul's venture on Christ. He goes on to say, if there's any difference, it is that coming is the first act of the soul when it is taught by the Holy Spirit, and that believing is a continued act or habit which never ends. No man comes who does not believe, and all who come go on believing. This is is incredible news, isn't it? Let's look at verse 40 one more time. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. Now, there's another key word here in verse 40. I want you to mark it down, circle it, highlight it, check it, do something with it. It's the word everyone. Everyone. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. Who's everyone? You're everyone. You're everyone. Well, what does everyone mean? It means the youngest child who looks on the son and believes in him will have eternal life. It means that the oldest sinner who looks on the son and believes in Jesus will have eternal life. Every, everyone means regardless of what you have done, regardless of how many times you've rejected Christ, if today, if you look on the son and believe in him, you will have eternal life. Everyone means everyone, unqualified. Everyone means there's no barrier, there's no difficulty, there are no exceptions. No one can say that they are excluded. Just come to Christ. Come to Christ. Take note here of the simplicity of the gospel. How simple are the terms of the gospel? I'm afraid that many times we complicate the gospel. We add in so many things that are all true. But they can, we're not careful, they can confuse people. Here's the simplicity of the gospel. The simplicity of the gospel is coming and believing. We go back to what Ben read earlier. What was what did Jesus say is the work of God? That you believe. See, they wanted to perform some kind of act so that they could get this physical bread. And Jesus says, no, you've got it all wrong. You don't understand at all. Here's the work of God. Believe. This is all that God requires of you to believe, then everything else along that accompanies salvation will come with it. As I said before, people believe, if they believe in Christ, they will repent. I know we get so hung up, and rightly so, on repentance, because repentance is critical. But if we're not careful, we will elevate repentance over belief. Jesus says, believe, I guarantee you'll repent. When you see me for who I am, you won't have any problem repenting. See? Simple gospel. As one commentator said, the most ignorant, the most sinful, the most hardened need not despair. They have but to come and believe. Four questions. Will you come? Will you believe? Have you come? Have you believed? 